Hi, everybody. What a great crowd. How's it going? This is wonderful. My name is Mark Anastasio. I'm the program manager at the Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts. <laughs> it's a little chilly. Um, thank you guys for being such a rugged crowd. Um, we've, we've put on quite a few shows here at the Rocky Woods, uh, but this one, this one is very special. Um, tonight, you're going to watch It in the Rocky Woods. And we have a special guest with us tonight. The teleplay writer, the screenwriter, the man who wrote It for TV, uh, Lawrence D. Cohen is here for a Q&A in between the two parts of the film. Larry will be up here with my pal John Campapiano, who's producing a documentary on the film It, uh, to do a brief conversation in between the two parts of the movie, and then we'll have you guys have a chance to ask some questions. I already told you about the fact that we have a screen-used Pennywise costume inside the cabin. That clown suit in there uh, is in this movie, and you have a chance to take a picture with it, and if you do, please tag the Coolidge at Coolidge Midnight, uh, and that would be great for marketing purposes. <laughs> but here's it, ladies and gentlemen, in the Rocky Woods. Do they float? Oh, yes. They float, Georgie. They float. You guys survived part one of it. Congratulations. We're now going to do a Q&A with the teleplay writer of the movie that you're watching, Lawrence D. Cohen, moderated by filmmaker John Campapiano. Does that sound good to you guys? Yeah. They're going to talk for a bit, and then we'll have a mic for audience questions as well. Uh, but give them a warm welcome. Here's Larry Cohen and John Campapiano, everybody. Thanks for coming out, everybody. It's chilly, to say the least. Thanks for braving it and coming to our equivalent of the Barons here. So, um, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I got to interview Larry last year for a documentary we were doing about the miniseries, so I was able to go back and review some of what we talked about. And it wasn't uh, Larry's first Stephen King project, so I, I'm hoping Larry could talk a little bit about his first uh, experience with King and then how he came to work on it. The uh, fortuitous and lucky thing in my life that really started my career as a screenwriter um, was Carrie, um, which was Steve's first book. I was just a few months out of college, moved to New York, and was a film critic and um, theater critic for New in New York for the Hollywood Reporter in California. I was, I was their stringer, and um, they paid a grand five dollars a review, which was not quite enough to pay rent. So I needed to look for a day job. The day job I ended up getting um, was reading for a legendary television and film producer and talk show host in New York, David Suskind. So long story short, um, one of the first projects I found was a thin manuscript when I came back from lunch one day. And it only had three words on it. And the words were Carrie and by Stephen King. And it was this first novel. I opened it, read the first 10 pages in which the title character has her first period in the girls' locker room from the shower and is bullied by the other girls and a light bulb explodes in the ceiling. And I read those 10 pages and I was his. Long and short of it was I went insane for the book I raved about it to my boss. He could be less interested in making a movie about a girl who has her first period. So there wasn't much persuasion there, nor did anybody in Hollywood bite. And I figured that that was it. Um, I went off to produce a movie in Arizona. I moved to LA. I'd heard that somebody and a producer in LA had optioned Carrie, but I let it go. Moved to LA ended up needing a job yet again, and ended up going to work for, as a story editor for another legendary producer, a man who had done Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. I was not interested in working for another producer, but the, the story is as follows quickly. He told me the projects he was developing. I couldn't be less interested in anything that he was doing. 
I thanked him for his time, said goodbye, walked down the hall, and he called out to me and said, Larry, there's one more project that I forgot to tell you I've optioned, and it's this little book you haven't heard of called Carrie. And the light bulb sort of went on in my head, and I went either um, my brain is exploding or this is destiny, and I turned around and took the job, and I ended up writing that script. So, long and short of it is um, I got the opportunity to write the movie and some years went by. In 1986, my agent in Los Angeles called to say, how would I like to write another Stephen King? And this was based on a yet unpublished book. Um, and I said, absolutely, I'm interested. And he said, one more thing, it's long, very long. <laughs> and, that was really the understatement of my life at that point. Um, the next morning, the Federal Express band came to the door bearing the most humongous box that Federal Express makes to ship things. And I said, thank you very much, accepting the box. And he said, wait a minute. And he went back to the elevator and came out with another box. And it was equally unwieldy. And I realized that was this manuscript. And I sat down, it was still the typed manuscript, fresh from the publisher, it still had crossed out lines, it still had m notes in the margin, and I sat down and read it. And in the first 20 or so pages, I read the scene that you saw tonight, very early in the film, which was the two Denborough brothers, uh, Bill and little brother Georgie. Please, Bill, tell me a story. Maybe later. The Magic Stone story. Please, Bill, please. Go b bug somebody else, you little cootie. I don't feel so hot. I sort of fell in love with these siblings and their affection and their bickering with each other and followed Georgie down the watery street from the flood and the little paper boat going into the drain and Georgie meeting Pennywise the Clown. Hi, Georgie. Aren't you going to say hello? Oh, come on, bucko. Don't you want a balloon? I went the same way that I had felt about, about Carrie's sequence in the Carrie book, which was this was fantastic, and I had, had, had to do it. And that's sort of the story of how it began. I immediately said yes without reading hardly more than another 30 pages of the book, and I had another 1,100 to go. And I flew out to LA, met with the producers, and I told them more than anything, not only did I want to do it, but I thought that we should be doing this as eight or 10 hours for ABC, which was the network that had bought it. The thrilling conclusion of Stephen King's It, Tuesday night. And they had paid a million bucks for it, and we sat down and began a series of meetings, and I realized, A, they were very nervous because horror was not a genre back then in the late 80s. There had been nothing like it. There had been the Twilight Zone. There had been Raoul Dahl's summer series that was on CBS. But in terms of any substance or expenditure of time and money, horror was not something that had been done on television yet. And the reason for that, which I quickly realized, was there, there was a department at the network called Standards and Practices. And it was essentially the censoring side of ABC. And the real problem was that the number one priority that was the foundation of Standards and Practices was that there should be no jeopardy to children. And I thought about it, and I went, has anybody at the network read this book? So I took a series of meetings with standards and practices as well as the network executives and I told my producers that from now on they really needed to take these meetings, not me. The other thing that happened that was a sort of astonishing part of the experience was my producers said to me, how do you feel about the director George Romero directing this project? And I was ecstatic and I was completely nuts for that idea. They organized a meeting. Romero had read the book, loved it, 
and immediately said yes. And we began dreaming up an eight to 10 hour version of this 1100 plus page book. That did not work out that way, as you can gather. We spent a lot of time working together and the first great realization about it was that television in those days, two hour television movies were divided into what they call seven acts. And what that meant was that there were commercials at seven places in the course of the show. And for the most part, they tended to distract, let the gas out, and the energy flag. Our realization, and it was again the light bulb that went on with George and myself, was that the Losers Club was comprised of seven kids. And each one, for night one, for example, could have an act that you met the adult, and then you saw their child backstory that led them to this place. And we went, rather than being a distraction and rather than this being something that was bad, ironically, it was the television medium that was going to permit this to happen. So that's sort of the, the lead up in how we got here. Larry, can you talk a little bit about Tim Curry yeah. and your yeah. thoughts about him and uh, maybe other names that were kicked around? And the, the casting of the, of the miniseries in general was an interesting one because this, the, the network was increasingly nervous about the project and about the expenditure of that many hours, even though that's how many I wrote as a Bible outline. And they wanted to ensure their bets every way they knew how. So they cast the seven leads and the seven loser, uh, members of the Losers Club with um, real high television cue names that were instantly recognizable. And in retrospect, I think it was a really strong idea. When it came to Tim Curry, and, and casting Pennywise, there were other people, there were a couple of other possibilities. Malcolm McDowell, I think at one point, was considered. And the reality is that Tim Curry, who had starred in Rocky Horror Show, was as good and perfect a match as was imaginable, and we never looked elsewhere. The great thing about him was that he brought that ability to not only be terrifically funny, but incredibly scary, which is a very weird, fine line to match. And uh, there's an expression in the movie business that an actor beats the page. And the reality with Tim Curry was that he straddled that line the same way, in a weird way, that, that um, the, the Margaret White in Carrie, that Piper Laurie, managed to do both things at once. She managed to scare the hell out of you, and it was just borderline almost laughable because it was so operatic. And what Tim did was, without the aid of really any kind of prosthetic devices, except in a very few instances, and without any CGI, because we were living in a time that there was no CGI yet, he managed to virtually steal the picture by acting the crap out of it. Beep, beep, Richie. Come back anytime. I'll show you how to slow down. They all slow down here. So before we open up to the uh, the audience for questions, I'm I'm fascinated about the George Romero connection because um, having worked on a Pet Cemetery documentary before this, he was attached to that project too, and that fell through. And so I'm curious, could you talk a little bit about how that fell through for George and how it ended up such that he did not work on it? George and I um, developed a, a great relationship and a great friendship. I would send him. For example, a 40-page Bible, which was representing the 10 hours of the material. And he would write back with notes in the margins. And we just had an incredible correspondence and relationship. As the studio got more and more nervous, they decided we should be eight hours. And then the suggestion came we should be six hours. And finally, the suggestion was we'll do it and we'll make it at four hours. Given that George and I, I think, dreamed that this would be the horror movie to end all horror movies and really stake out a claim um, with a very different audience, um, that was highly discouraging. In the meantime, the 
two producers um, were having trouble negotiating a, a proper budget for the film. That way it was going to be made at a level they thought it was good. At that moment, George decided a, that he had another commitment of another movie project that was a go at that point. And I think he was, like I was at that point, slightly discouraged that what we thought should be the equivalent of what Netflix and HBO and those cable networks are able to do today, we were probably 20 years too early for that experience. Today, if it had been published and it was coming out and it was 1,100 pages, we would be um, the next big show that was that it wasn't going to have an hour restriction. However many hours it took to tell what was in fact a novel for television, that would be the way it would be made today. And George left the project, the producers left the project, Tommy Lee Wallace came on as a director and loved the first part and had some problems with and questions about the second two hours and said to me, would I do a rewrite at, the, at that point? I had been working on the project for two years, was incredibly backed up with other work, and at that point I said, basically, go with God, it's enough for me. That was where, you know, the dream ended up. The result, ironically, was that it got made, it got made well, especially, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of the first two hours because it, it really resembles the non-negotiable parts of this book that I think are iconic um, and the some of the best stuff that Steve has done um, as a writer. The, the following morning in November in, in 1990 when it came on ABC, um, the ratings had gone through the roof the show between the two nights attracted 30 million people, which in those days was unheard of. And in part, it opened the door to horror as a genre being done for television. Thanks, Larry. That's great. So I guess we'll open up some questions. Tells with the kids and later on. Yes. Are there any of those details that you contributed that are just from you know your own fears or from anecdotes from your own life? The as as I recall, because it's quite a while ago, um, the sequence, the, the general thing that I think I responded to in the book and did everything to heighten in the material uh, is the relationship between the kids. I mean, I think finally what Steve puts his finger on like Stand By Me is that we're stronger together rather than as as freaks by ourselves. No! Yes! No! Yes! No! Yes! Yes! No! Yes! 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 No. Yes! Yes! yes. 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 Don't let it get you, man. You saw it too. I didn't want to. But you, you did. Um, so that's the general answer. Specifically, my recollection is the scene in the shower, for example, with Pennywise in the drain is an invention, um, I think, from, from my head. Here I am, Wheezy. Oh, come back anytime. Bring your friends. It's, it's a book where the challenge was how to take not only dozens, but perhaps hundreds of episodes and bring it down to a four-hour format um, and keep the story clear, dramatic, and concise while preserving the things that I think people remember from the book. There are a zillion things that are gone and not in this four-hour version um, that in truth, m many of them are things I don't miss. They're not things that I thought were the story when pared down really ruthlessly to tell. I still think, like Steve King thinks, is that in this case, long would have been better and more would have been better. So this is kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, are there any scenes that you wish could have made it into this final cut? There's nothing that kills me that I'm missing. Um, 
there were things that given the opportunity, whether I had 10 hours or 20 hours, probably never would have made it in. The, the, the sequence in um, the second half of the story um, in which Bev has essentially a, a gang bang with all the boys. Um, that just wouldn't have made it in. It had nothing to do with censoring it for television. It just didn't feel right. The episode of Chud, which many of you don't know what that means, but it's, it's something that's in the book, um, again, is not something I probably would have gone for. There was one sequence that I wrote and would have killed for and just didn't make it into the, into, into the show. And it was the one where the kids create basically an underground little smoke den. And in essence, they almost go on an acid trip together to understand what Pennywise is and what they're facing. And that piece just didn't make it. Um, the other little detail that was very much a standards and practice problem is that one of my very, very favorite iconic shots in the movie, in the show, is when they join hands. And in the book, they cut each other's hands and do a blood oath. Being that we were in the particular age of AIDS, the, that was absolutely not a consideration for the network to do. Um, nonetheless, that shot and the last shot of Stan in the bathtub at the end of night one are two of my favorite things in the piece. Did you ever get to meet Stephen King? Yeah, we've been friends um, since the beginning. Um, I lucked out when we were shooting Carrie, we corresponded with each other, and during the shooting of the film, I had another project meeting in New York, so I invited him to come down from Maine and go with me to the dailies in New York City where the film was being edited. And we ended up going out for lunch and becoming great friends. He was incredibly complimentary about the script of Carrie, and we ended up with a, both a working relationship and a friendship that was just a truly special thing. And, and I've done a bunch of other Steve's pieces as well along the way. Uh, what's your opinion on the remake? <laughs> I, I like it more than not for openers. Um, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's getting the chance, you know, 20 plus years later to see what an unrestricted version of, of it would be, meaning it could tolerate an R rating, which was not something television in those days clearly could do. It has CGI up, up the wazoo. Um, and I think that's good and bad. Um, I think there's, on some level, less is more. So I'm a much bigger fan of the Pennywise as he's portrayed in, in this version. I think what Steve is about largely and what one of the things that makes him a great writer is he understands where things need to be spelled out and where things are better left to the imagination. So as a result, there are visceral things in the It movie which I think are very 2017 that are a result of horror having gone through the Saw period, the level of where, where gross out figures and there needs to be a scare every five minutes. Um, I'm, a, I'm not of that school. I'm much more interested in the relationships than in scaring the pants off you every minute. So um, I liked it. I had I had reservations um, about it when all was said and done, but I thought it, I thought it was pretty good. I'm interested. I, I thought the biggest loss in the movie was not having the adults and the kids' lives juxtaposed against each other. And it wasn't that it's bad to just have the kids, but somehow I think 
there was a great deal to be gained by this structure of intercutting their lives and their memories. And as a result, you formed more of an emotional attachment and a bond to them. I heard that there was a rough draft of the second part that would have had, I guess, um, Bev's husband going after them before they changed it. Could you talk about that original draft? Indeed. It's much closer to what was in the book, so rather than spoiling it because you're not going to see it, um, it was something that was scripted and just didn't make it into the cut. He, he definitely, though, followed her to Derry, so one had not only Bev's husband coming after her, but you also had Henry Bowers coming after her. They clearly just went with, with one choice. Just as kind of a follow-up to that and taking into consideration that you did have to pull some of those things out that were in the original book, um, is there any consideration into the thought of, in the age of Netflix and Amazon Prime, extrapolating what you were able to do originally into a seven um, part series so that you could concentrate on the individual characters and put in those things that were actually so important into the movie that you weren't able to get in originally due to the constrictions of the Samson's practices. I, well, I think number one, the, the, the current redo of it is dealing their way with it and we'll sort of see what they come up with for part two when it gets released, you know, a year from now. Um, what I've learned about, about stuff in this business, you know, is that you never say never, meaning Carrie has now had about nine lives um, and just keeps again and again and again being remade in different ways. Um, in, including a musical that I've written with, with my collaborators that went from an absolute horror show in the truest sense in life with the Royal Shakespeare Company and a flop on Broadway to now becoming uh, an enormous success with over 500 productions. So what I've learned is just not to say never to anything. Um, anything is possible. I think for the next couple of years, the IT storyline is really in the hands of, of Warner Brothers' new line and the director who's making this, this next film. I think part of the popular wisdom around IT is that part one is great, part two might have been a misfire. I never saw it that way, and you even kind of mentioned it with the rewrite that was requested of you. Why do you think that's the case in popular wisdom, and, and, and do you believe that to be the case? Yeah, in all, um, in all candor, I do. I'm a huge fan of parts of it, and I don't want to spoil it because you're going to watch it. There are scenes that were iconic scenes, one in a Chinese restaurant. One with Bev going back to the house she grew up in. If you're wise, you'll run, dear, run. Because to stay will mean worse than your death. They, they float down there. They float. I worry about you, Bevy. I worry a lot. And you'll see those scenes. And the pieces that are pretty much that real sense of, of what Steve wrote that are in part two are really terrific. I think one of the reasons for the, the rap, there, there are a couple reasons. One is that the ending, ending payoff, and again, spoiler alert, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say what it is. It's faithful to what Steve wrote. If I had it to do differently, again, all these years later, I would involve the Tim Curry actor and whoever that is that would be playing Pennywise, and I utilize him rather than the direction that Steve went in or the, or the miniseries went in. It turned out to be just a very hard thing to execute, and it's one thing when you read it in a book and you fill it in with your imagination, when you have to face what at that point in time were 
insufficient monies and some problems with the special effects. I think there were there was a certain part of the audience that just shrugged. Um, many people love it. I mean, I'm, I'm in the critical of oneself um, category, I guess. Um, I, th I think there are fantastic things in it, but I think, in truth, the real success of it are the kids and their stories. And like Stand By Me, they feel incredibly true and believable and identifiable. And I fell in love with those seven kids of the Losers Club. It's a much harder thing to accomplish the adults and bring them to that same level. And I think that was, that was part of the problem. Well, let's thank Larry again for being here and for the trustees and the coolest. That's great. Thanks, Larry.